Bases dropped on Soccer's Morning Show. It's another round of soccer down here. Hang on just a second. Sorry about 9.06. Um, I was trying to load something, and the rundown for the morning is a little jumbled, but it's still pretty much the same. Uh, Bart Keeler joining us in hour one instead of his traditional hour two visit here on Wednesday because the real world has decided to tap Bart on the shoulder and go, bruh, need you uh, to do something in the 10 o'clock hour. So Bart joins us in the 10 o'clock hour as I put my caffeine down for the morning, at least for the morning show, not necessarily for the morning. Uh, Dylan Butler, if he has no uh, interruptions when it comes to this or any other planet, will be hanging out with us in his traditional hour number two slot. Jarrett will be joining us in hour number two as well because of the real world intervening. And yeah, Coco, that's where we're starting. We're going to start with uh, we're going to start with that, Sean. We're going to get into that, too, because that was another reason why I was 906 this morning. And uh, once again, profound apologies for coming in at 906. You know, Turner time just kind of sits there and it's just like, bruh, here's what's going on. Uh, so the rundown this morning, obviously, wall pass Wednesday, anything is on the table. We finally have an MLS Next Pro schedule and we have the, the same number of teams in every division but one. Thank you, Rochester NYFC. So uh, Atlanta United 2 schedule is out in MLS Next Pro. We got stuff with Champions League. We've got stuff with Violette, which we're getting into uh, with Bart. I know that yesterday we kind of got into uh, we, we got into the uh, Alston and Bird findings, kind of, sort of. And then we took a right turn uh, and kind of got into... The, the after effects of it, which was very, very cool. I'm glad that we got into this discussion. And we didn't necessarily get into the whole idea of the investigation itself. And when Bart comes on, want to get into that. Morning, Joe Boss. Morning, Will. Let's see who is in this morning. Morning, Parzal. Good to see you at the match the other day. Uh, morning, Sean. Morning, Coco. Morning, Alex. Morning, Ricky. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I think that's everybody so far, at least who has waved and said hello. Yes, will. Absolutely. You will be seeing folks on September 10 and June 23. And so, uh, good to finally get a schedule out to know what's going on. And so I have, as, as, as you guys know, for those of you who are watching on Twitch, I have my schedule. I have my desk schedule here and I got the chance to fill out with uh, everything involving MLS Next Pro, finally got the chance to fill out the schedule at least into August and September. So, you know, it's a bit of a bit of a slow start, but we finally are getting the grid squared away. We've got Open Cup coming up. We've got Tormenta coming up. By the way, Tormenta will be on the show tomorrow. Yeah, and the rules. Pick your opponent in the playoffs. How about that? Pick your opponent in the playoffs. I mean, MLS Next Pro, they're trying to figure out ways to, to kind of draw your interest. So, yeah, I pick you, and then you end up losing. How's that going to hang with you? Uh, yeah, and I saw, yeah, Will, I did see that you guys had uh, your your matchup against uh, Cincinnati. And uh, morning, Sam. So uh, we're kind of, once again, I know this will surprise you on a wall pass Wednesday. We're kind of all over the place. So whatever you guys want to talk about within, uh, you know, within the parameters of what we're going through, like I said, uh, Bart will join us in hour one. Jared joins us in hour two. Dylan joins us. Uh, in hour two, if he's not thrust upon uh, the real world. So we got that. Uh, uh, before we get into, uh, before we get into a Violette and morning kickoff and all the other stuff, uh, big thanks to our friends at Trinity Christian last night, Mike Townsend and uh, wins for them on the boys and the girls side against North Clayton. So uh, once again, for those watching on Twitch, uh, I guess I should turn this around. So we have uh, the scarf from our friends at Trinity. Once again, this will find its way here in Office HD. And uh, there's your lion. So Trinity has the wraparound scarf. Trinity there. And the go lions on this side. So once again, thanks to uh, Mike Townsend and everybody at uh, Trinity Christian. And, and going back a little bit, in session is going to be uh, tonight at 7 third uh, seven o'clock and we'll catch up with some coaches we'll catch up with uh, coach Mateo at Monday's mill we'll catch up with Rod Martin down at Spencer as a part of breaking down everything that's going on here in the state 
as we're now the business end of the schedule. And a previous guest, Perry Soccer. Once again, thanks to the Perry Panthers. Very, very cool stuff here. And so Perry Soccer will find its way up here in the office in very short order. And this once again gets added to the collection. Perry, our town, very, very cool stuff. So once again, thanks to all of our our high school coaches that uh, hang out with us on a daily basis and hang out with us on Soccer is in Session. That is tonight uh, at 7 o'clock. Jason goes over all the rankings, all the scores, gets you set for the weekend, and uh, lets you know what happened with uh, the matches with North Clayton and Trinity Christian. Uh, Girls' uh, game was called when it got to 10 early in the second half, 10-goal margin. And next time we have Jessica Charman on the show, I want to talk to her about the girls' match because she said something that was very, very interesting. And I think it speaks to the larger picture when it comes to uh, high school soccer is that, uh, yes, North Clayton, they ended up getting beat by 10. And it was nine goals had been scored in 22 minutes. And the center ref, uh, basically, they're actually, yes, and Joe Boston will get into that too. Uh, there, There is a first half mercy rule where you have to play at least 20 minutes. And... Uh, Trinity Christian scored nine goals in 22 minutes, and it was a rule that I didn't know existed. Found out about it when we were on the air yesterday. Is that yeah? You get you can you call a half at 20 minutes, and center ref called it at nine nil after 20, 22. And so we go to halftime, come back, they score the goal. Uh, uh, Trinity does to make it 10, and then that was your match. But Jess down on the sideline said something really really interesting to us after the match. She said that the North Clayton girls were just out there having fun. Yes, they, yes, Trinity Christian was, was, you know, putting the ball in the back of the net very, very quickly, had a lot of goals and bunches. And the North Clayton girls, despite what was on the scoreboard, were having fun. They're, they're, they were enthusiastic. They were smiles on their faces. And I thought that was really cool. And so uh, I want to get into that with Jess next time she's on the show, just about what we saw out of the the North Clayton girls, where I know a lot of folks would sit there and look at the scoreboard and go, wow, it was a, you know, it was a 10 nil game and they call it after 24 minutes of action. But the girls from North Clayton had smiles on their faces the entire time. They were having fun. And I think that speaks to the larger picture of what's going on with high school soccer. So uh, I want to catch up with Jess about that. Uh, Boys match had a three nil win for, Trinity Christian, it was 2-0 for a lot of the match. And then second half with about 20 minutes to go, third goal went on the board for Trinity Christian, and the the air just kind of got taken out of the match at that point. So big wins for Trinity Christian on the boys' and girls' side last night against North Clayton in region play in in Region 4 Quad A. Friday, we will be at, at Archer for the Brookwood Archer doubleheader. Right now, 537 30 on the SDH app, SDH network. And on the girls' side, two teams ranked top 10 in 7A. So we'll catch up with that. And uh, big game in region play with uh, Brookwood on the boys' side. So far, they're at 6-0. and And Archer is at 2-2. Two and two. So Archer is at three games back. They need to get the win if they're going to try to close the gap and, and make sure that they're going to find their way into the postseason as one of the four seeds in their region so we'll sit there and look at that but brookwood and archer on friday doubleheader at archer and thanks to uh, our friends at archer high school for letting us come out on friday thanks to our friends at trinity christian for letting us come out last night for region four quad a action with north clayton uh wins for trinity christian on both sides so uh, soccer down here games of the week on the high school side you can catch those on uh what am, I, what am I trying to say? Soccerdownhere.net, website, website and, and app. You can download the app available on iOS and Android. So uh, Joe Boston, in that same vein, in Jake's middle school match last week, apparently the opposing coach asked our coach not to mercy rule them so their kids could play a full match. And a hat trick for Jake in the first half. That's interesting. Uh, so that's uh, that was that's your high school stuff. Once again, thanks to our friends at Perry and Trinity Christian for adding things to Office HD. I've got to figure out where I'm going to hang them so you can see them on a daily basis. But uh, no, but no. Once again, thanks. And once and 
Uh, also, thanks to those of you who so far have picked up the uh, Jessica Charman Olive and York T-shirt with proceeds benefiting the uh, Anton Walks Foundation. So far, at least $300 after the first day, $300 on the board heading to the Anton Walks Foundation for the most obnoxious voice in sports radio, Jessica Charman. So taking taking something like that and turning it into a, a donation for the Anton Walks Foundation, you can go to Olive and York or go to Jess's Twitter uh, at Jess Talks Footy and get more information on it. But yes, uh, I believe they're still printing the T-shirts. We have one coming to Office HD, and we will wear that with a great source of pride. Uh, yeah, I know, Sean, exactly. Uh, what it does, uh, it, Sean, <laughs> Sean, you want to know what HD stands for? It's better than, it, than SD. Yes. So what it stands for is that large television over there. That's what it stands for. The large TV over there is in high definition. So that's what it stands for. Uh, all right. So opening kickoff. Brought to us by our friends at Kickoff Coffee, kickoffcoffeeco.com. we got a couple of different things for, for kick opening kickoff this morning. And there's your QR code. Blocking my face, which folks think is a public service for those of you who are watching on Twitch. Uh, kickoffcoffeeco.com and kickoffcoffeeco on all your social medias, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Don't forget to use the code soccer down here 15 And you get 15% off of your purchase. And they, in turn, at Kickoff Coffee, We'll sit there and invest 10% in youth initiatives. Very, very cool stuff from our friends at Kickoff Coffee and kickoffcoffeeco.com. So, all right, a couple different things this morning. And we can start with, we'll start with Violette because Violette, let me see if I, let me see if I have this correct. And obviously Twitch pitch, correct me if, if I have anything that's out of kilter here. So, for the match last night in Austin at Q2, which did not look like it had a full house, by the way, for the second leg in a very, very important round round of 16 for uh, Con- Con- CONCACAF Champions League. Yeah, Coco, we're kind of get, or yeah, we're kind of, we're kind of getting there, but it, it won't be necessarily pointing and laughing. Uh, Lineup gets released an hour before the match, and it literally is your starting 11 and three substitutes. And we mentioned yesterday how Violette is working connections in the NPSL, specifically at FC Motown, and they grabbed, I think it was four players, from a combination of FC Motown and connections that they had here in the United States. Because seven players weren't allowed in because of visa issues. Whatever those issues were, uh, they were not they were not uh, divulged, but seven players couldn't make it through. Coaches couldn't make it through. So you end up with, with the connections here in the United States, through the NPSL. And we should probably catch up with our friends at FC Motown to, to find out what this process was like. But you ended up with... 11 plus three substitutes. Austin scores twice, but they can't score the third. One of the biggest, if not the biggest upset in the history of CONCACAF Champions League happens last night with Violette advancing to the round of eight. Folks were sitting there and trying to figure out, okay, what's the uh, the significance of all of this? And I mean, Violette survived. They were down. I mean, they were down two nil in the match, and you go twelve minutes of extra time, surviving that, winning two nil, and advancing. Fourteen players available. Eleven plus three. And I know a lot of folks are looking at Amro Tarek for his goal in his debut at Austin. You're looking at all of the political turmoil. You hadn't played in 289 days. You are you're basically a club team because there is no because there's no league. There's no league in Haiti at all. No competitive games, 289 days. All the visa issues. And you end up with this win. 
You have all of the violence that was there in the country. And Violette works their way through. You I mean, you're looking at humanitarian disaster, violence. You had President Jovenel Moise killed in July of 2021. Doctors Without Borders forced to close a hospital in Port-au-Prince because of the violence. A U.N. report on the situation caused a U.N. official to liken some of the areas in the country to a, a, quote, living nightmare, end quote. And they win it 3-2. From our friends at The Athletic, Joshua Clokey. Austin FC squad, according to Transfermarkt, has an approximate total value of uh, a little over $50 million. The Liga Hessian had been suspended and de- has been suspended indefinitely. For Violette, according to Transfermarkt, the value of the players on the squad, $150,000. And remember, the first leg was played the first leg was played in the Dominican Republic because of the violence going on in Haiti. In the second leg, the numbers are just flat staggering. Austin, to no surprise, outshoots Violet 33 to 3. 33 to 3. 33 to 3. Think about that. I mean, literally, that's like red card numbers. That is literally like red card numbers. I mean, it is stunning, some of the stuff. Let me see if, I want to see if I can get more of the numbers here in this match. And I'm going to check in with our friends at SofaScore and see if I can come up with something. Okay, so here, found the box score. Austin going into win the match of minus 1250. No real surprise. So, stats. 76% possession for Austin FC. Once again, no surprise. Total shots. And this is once again from our friends at SofaScore who've updated what Joshua Clokey put in. Total shots, 35-6. Total shots, 10-0. 14 off target, 11 blocked. 10 corners. 11 fouls each, fine. Five big chances, three big chances missed, one hit the woodwork, 26 shots inside the box, which means nine outside the 18. 585 passes on the day compared to 196 total. Accurate passes shooting at 63%. Long balls, 22 to 20. Crosses, 22 out of 64. When was the last time 64 crosses came across your bow? 22 of 64 for Austin FC. 2 of 4 for Violet. Duels 1 was about 50-50, especially in the air. 67 clearances. 67. 67 blanking clearances for Violet. 67 clearances. <laughs> For Violette. Two goals called back, one for a handball in the buildup, and the other was for an offside. Denied a PK in the second half after Zardis tackled in the box. I mean, this is in the, the first leg. It's just absolutely crazy. You know, uh, Violette's players. Yeah, yeah, and obviously, you're going to milk the clock as best you can. Steven Saba told TV cameras, we went through a lot, man. We went through a lot. Didn't have our best players. We fought and fought and fought. This means a lot to us. We're not going to stop fighting no matter what comes our way. Doing this for our country, doing this for the boys at home, the seven or eight boys that couldn't come with us. Visa issues depleted the squad. Violet acknowledged before the second leg, not every member of the team had been granted a visa because of the issues in Haiti. Wouldn't be the first time. Remember what happened with Kavali last year with the New England Revolution? They had to withdraw from the matchup. Source, uh, who did not, uh, not authorized to speak publicly, according to Cloakie. 
Fifteen players obtained visas, several more that were still processing. CONCACAF said it received assurances from Violette that the club had obtained more than the required number of visas for first-team players to travel and compete. Midfielder Shad Sun Mian said before the game, some of the players who didn't get visas are really important to us. If we have to go with just 12, we're still going to put our hearts into the game. Dressed a squad of 14, no backup keeper, total of 12, five starters, six subs who dressed in the first leg didn't make the trip. Went to FC Motown, got two. Webbins Prinsime, team manager. Players showed that no matter the adversity we are facing, they need to keep going. They need to be strong to face these challenges. Players, we keep them of the mind that they can win this competition. We know that we have a lot of good teams in this competition, but the players have to trust they can do everything on the field, end quote. Friends and family being displaced. Saba hesitant to call the team's discussions therapy, but the floor is open to players to share what's on their minds. Quote, to know how someone feels, do they have any pain in some way, we want to be there to help them, Saba told Cloakey. Violet represents not just Haiti, but the entire Caribbean in the Champions League. Is the only team from the region to qualify for the round of 16, now for the quarters. They're supposed to be a family, said Saba. Goals not just to compete in makeshift fields that look nothing like Austin's. Their goals to be here for one another. San Mian said it's true. There are a lot of problems. Doesn't give us any advantages, but we've always said we can compete with the best in the world. That's what you got from Violette. To get that from Violette is beyond amazing. So, uh, in the ways of March Madness and in the ways of Ted Lasso, happy Ted Lasso Day for those who are celebrating, we welcome in Bart Keeler. Bonjour. So, Violette, our friends from Violette, is the opening kickoff this morning in celebration of March Madness and in celebration of everything Ted Lasso, Violette. Knocks off Austin. Dude, I haven't even gotten to Pep Guardiola yet. <laughs> Violette is our opening kickoff this morning. And I, I think we can look at it in, on two different fronts. It's damn awesome that they did it. But at the same time, if you're Austin, you're looking at this and you're crashing out of CONCACAF Champions yep. League with Violette out of Haiti. Yeah. Yeah. It, oh, it's it's rough because I mean I, I think back to the Atlanta United CONCACAF Champions League games and you know I think we would all agree that the results on the road except for that final one didn't necessarily go our way right um, but they were good enough to where you go all right fine you come home you take care of business right mm-hmm. um, and we did we were able to come home and take care of business against teams that quite honestly were much better put together, actively playing, um, able to get visas. What Austin, I, I, I mean, look, I think you gave Violet a lot of praise and they deserve it, but the, the way that Austin, even with a rotated squad down in the Dominican Republic, handled this tie is really embarrassing, to be quite honest. I mean, sorry, but like you, you don't get to lose to a team that isn't functionally playing at this point in time, isn't able to feel the full team of their own players. And, you know, there are a lot of Austin fans making us think about, you know, a penalty kick call or whatever. That would have just tied the get match for you. Like that would have just tied the matchup for you. That's not, that wouldn't have won it. You still would have had to play. Um, and so it's just, I don't know how there's any positive spin for Austin coming from this. And, you know, to me, the funny thing is they got the the team with a tree in its logo was undone by a team with a tree on the field. (laughs) So you're making me laugh with, with caffeine in my system. So then Coco. Uh, thoughts on O'Shea Nation's performance last night? Thought he did very well, didn't make it about himself, managed the time wasting well, didn't lose control of the game in the tense moments. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people 
on the Austin Sun complained that he helped Violet, but again, <laughs> they need to look at themselves. Dude, you had 11 minutes um, in the second half. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because he did. He added what? I mean, it was almost 11 minutes, I think, almost 12 mm -hmm. when it was all said and done, right? Um, mm -hmm. I forget exactly what the final, because I know they gave nine. And I was like, it's oh, 101, okay. it was 101 uh, and change when they blew the final. Yeah, there you go. So, yeah, because, Coco, to your point, like, giving the, I think it was given nine minutes, right? Mm -hmm. And then also adding time for what would have been lost time during that stoppage time was appropriate. I mean, that's, I thought that was uh, what we need to see more of. Coco, once again, good thing that he was basically a non-factor in the match last night. And Austin took an MLS one, and this is Coco. Coco says Austin took basically an MLS 1.0 approach to CONCACAF Champions League, took a second team to the Dominican I, I don't, Republic. That's not an MLS 1.0 approach, though, in my opinion. I think that's a, a smart approach to a competition against a team that, quite honestly, your second team should still beat. Like, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. that they're, Like, our MLS Next Pro teams should be able to handle Violet in a yeah. two-legged playoff, mm -hmm. you know? And I don't think that, like, bringing a rotated squad down to Haiti was something – bad i really just don't i'm sorry um i don't think that's a 1.0 approach i actually think that's more of a 2.0 3.0 approach because you actually have the depth to hopefully rotate a squad uh it just didn't work and it, it failed miserably and part of that is tactics from josh wolf you know I, I think sometimes you have to realize that you can't always play the first team strategy with your second team players because they're just not good enough and amro tar um, can't have a, an own goal the way that he did also that and that that's absolutely right as well. I mean, the, the, it was a spectacular finish. Absolutely, still an own goal. Um, I, I I think that it's it's right to criticize the performance. I don't necessarily that like. I don't think that bringing a second choice team was necessarily the bad approach because, I mean, how many John? How many Premier League teams do the same thing in a Europa League yeah. matchup? You know, I mean, if it's Champions League, sure. But or, if, or, know, or, or, a, or FA or Gummy Bear Cup. Right. You know, the Carabao Cup is notoriously the the, the cup that all the youth players play in for these mm -hmm. Premier League teams. So yeah. I I don't I don't think their approach was terrible. They just played poorly. And you did you did didn't not take advantage of their chances, you know. Didn't execute the I way. I mean, the problem they have is that Jossi Zardas is playing for them. Really, that's the issue <laughs> they have. That's my hot take on the US roster drop day. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. So since uh, you went there uh, with the with the breaking news that happened yesterday during the show, and I got to mm -hmm. yeah, I got to use the breaking news sounder, and I was happy about that. Uh, Zendejas to the USMNT, and you get it. You get the roster announcement. What's uh, what what popped into your head once you saw a the breaking news, which gave us the breaking news sounder on the show, and then the, the announcement. Yeah, I thought that it was expected, to be honest, because as uh, the, for those of you who don't know, the drama behind Alejandro Zendejas is that he played, he is a U.S. born Mexican American player. Um, he played for uh, U.S. teams at the youth level, in fact, played for us in actual competitions. Therefore, he was tied to the U.S. Now, not cap tied officially at the senior level. Uh, but he was supposed to continue that path for the U.S. Mexico calls him up, plays him in a couple of matches uh, when they shouldn't have because he was not theirs to play. He would have had to have filed paperwork to officially declare for Mexico at the senior national team level. Um, we call him, you know, after that debacle, we call him up in January. Uh, he plays one game, played very well in the one game, despite, you know, not really getting a whole lot of the action. I thought he had a really good second half against um serbia but i mean i'm not surprised because i think the <laughs> he would have had to do more work to switch to mexico yeah and i think right now if you're looking at the u.s team you just have a much greater opportunity ahead of you being a u.s men's national team player than you do for el tree because we have despite mexico saying they're hosting the world cup it's the united states hosting the the matches that matter in that world cup 
Zendejas, and this is uh, the the player. The announcement is today. I'm I'm getting ahead of myself since uh, I've got all these things going on, and I'm still trying to get the the high school basketball uh, out of my. <laughs> Uh, it was a long so, weekend for you. you, you long, long week. <laughs> long, long, long week, brother. Uh, select, Zendejas' selection for El Tree, for those that don't remember. He did it without ever filing paperwork yeah. with FIFA yeah. to make him eligible to play for Mexico. Participation yeah. was with the USU 17s, tied him to the U.S. until he files a switch of association. FIFA approves the app. FIFA orders Mexico to forfeit those two senior friendlies in three U23 matches where yeah. Zendejas played. Issued a fine of just under eleven grand for yep. feeling for fieldings in Dejas didn't affect his eligibility to play for the USA or Mexico, provided you actually do finally submit the paperwork. Right, but you play El Tree's like, yeah, come on, and then you don't file the paperwork, and you end up getting fined eleven grand for it. I mean, come on now. Yeah, it's it was <laughs> okay. I'm gonna uh-huh. choose my words a little carefully. Uh-huh. Try to choose them carefully. Wait, what? But- it's another example of the Mexican Football Federation not truly respecting the players who they're yeah. trying to recruit. And I think of all the things that Greg Berhalter did very well during his time, which I'm sure we will get to that. Sure. Um, I think that he did a great job of letting the giving the players all the information they needed to make the decision without pressuring them into making a decision. Um and I think Zendejas is another example of Mexico being a little bit predatory in their recruiting practices, while the U.S. just said, hey, you want to come play? Okay. Um, again, he grew up in the United States. He grew up playing in the U.S. youth soccer system. So it's not like he, we had to do a whole lot of work to get him. Um, but, you know, it, it was just our ability to say, look, you can come in, experience the camp, uh, hang out with not even the top tier guys, but, you know, a, a couple of other dual nationals, Cade Cowell, Brandon Vasquez, both Mexican Americans with choices that they could make. I think Cade is officially cap tied. I, I think actually, no, he's not 21 yet. So I don't, I think he still has time to make a decision. Um, he may have played three matches already though. I expect Cade to be on the roster for this um, March, yeah, by the way, absolutely. I have zero reason to believe otherwise. Let's just put it that way. Um, so I think that was probably good for Zendejas. And I think more than anything, just good to get him in there and, and let him know that he, he can be a part of the squad moving forward. Um, to Coco's point, the winger depth right now is really good. But also, also, the winger depth was a little bit of a question because we have two guys in Brendan Aronson and Gio Reyna who historically for the U.S. have played on the wing, who I think we would all agree are not at their best out wide, right? Um Gio is obviously a very talented player who can probably play anywhere. He plays out wide for Dortmund all the time, but I think we all see him as more of a central attacking player. Brandon Aronson, very much the same. So Zendejas gives you legitimate winger depth, especially now that you're phasing out some guys like Jordan Morris, Paul Areola, um, you know, who I think we need to move on from. And he sees himself as an opportunity to fit in there. When you look at this, upcoming impending announcement what would what would surprise you when it because i i you know we can get we can get locked into names if you want but what would surprise you and what would give you reason for pause even though Mm. these matches are just kind of out there there's nothing i don't want to see paul Ariola, jordan morris or christian roldan i'm real i y'all know how i feel about christian roldan i think he's the most overrated player who's ever stepped foot in mls that's actually not true but he is he (laughs) he is widely overhyped for just being a guy who seems to be nice which i'm sure he's a very nice person um but i don't want to see those mls guys in there because we have younger mls talent that i want to see i mentioned Cade cowell brandon vasquez um you know, in, in the midfield, I, I'm hoping we see um, Georgie Mihailovic, Taylor Booth, I, Christian Roldan holding spots on the roster. Roldan, Ariola, Morris, it, it's not going to help us take that next step because we've seen what they can provide the United States men's national team. Um, we need to f- find better talent. And, and I think it's out there. Um, but also you have a guy like Cade Cowell who's 
seven to nine years younger than both Morris and Ariola, um, who plays a lot like both of them, but has obviously again nine years <laughs> to learn and be hopefully better than they are. And I would rather take that bet now on a Cade Cowell type player than another appearance by Paul Ariola where he doesn't really produce anything. Um, I love the phrase about Paul Ariola. He's always danger adjacent, but never actually dangerous. <laughs> Can we use that as a hashtag now? Danger, yeah, danger adjacent. adjacent. That is uh, the Scuff podcast, uh, their original. All right. Since you, since we, we are in this realm, since we are down this aisle of the grocery store, it's not quite frozen foods, and it's not quite the snack aisle. But we are going down this aisle here in the grocery store, uh, the grocery store of soccer. All right, since we're now in the discussions about the men's national team, Alston and Bird came out yesterday. And or was it a day and a half ago, two days ago? It's, it's like it all runs together now. Yeah, I know. So let's say two days for the sake of argument. Yesterday we got into the larger discussion about the the phrasing in Alston Bird that said that there, and I'm paraphrasing, just basically that there is nothing that should hold Greg Berhalter back from being considered to be manager, to continue being manager for the U.S. Men's National right. Team. Yes, we will get into the other items as we go here, and I know I've only got you for about another you know 10 to 12 minutes, so this might be more rapid fire than we would like. But let's start with the idea of Greg Berhalter legally being declared by Alston Bird that there is no reason to hold him back from being considered for the men's national team job. Yesterday, we went down the national team rabbit hole trying to figure out who it could be, who it should be. After Alston Bird came out, I doubt very much changed in your mind. I think I've said pretty clearly that I didn't want Greg Berhalter to get a second go at it as U.S. Men's National Team Manager, not because I think, and that was before this, right? Mm -hmm. That was before this, even the World Cup ended, just because I don't believe in two cycle managers at the right. national team level, especially if you haven't really won anything, right? right. Um, and I think the U.S. is in that weird, uh, we're in that weird situation where we're good enough to accept, expect better but still not quite at that level to feel like we should have done better. Um, we're not Canada, right? Where uh, uh -huh. John Hartman was clearly building something. Like, I, I think, I think Burhalter was building something. I, I really do. I don't necessarily think that it was a successful team, but it was a good team. Um, and I think that Burhalter did good enough to look back on his time as the U S men's national team manager with a positive light. Right. He had a very good win percentage. Um, he beat Mexico many times. Um, I don't think he was really ever challenged uh, outside of playing Mexico and Canada. Um, you know, we we struggled on the road in qualifying, which I know we always do. But we finished third overall in the qualifying campaign this time around, which despite being, I think, better than Mexico, Mexico finished better than us and Canada finished first. So I think there are ups and downs to the Burhalter tenure. I think ultimately it ended up being a positive, um, a, a, a good coaching job by Greg Berhalter. But I think that regardless, after this World Cup, you could have just said, thank you, Greg, for your service. We're going to move on and try to find someone better. Um, now, I, I though legally, I understand that they cannot exclude him from yeah. candidacy mm -hmm. because there's no reason to do that and i think now you're looking at it's more of a legal reason to say he's still a candidate so that you don't get in any trouble um or not dragged into court again which right. i think u.s soccer is trying to avoid um we don't need to go to court anymore i i just i think now would be a great time to look at greg and go look though the though the legalities of the situation do not exclude you from the search we don't feel that it would be the best decision for you to come back into the team, given all that has happened. Um, and especially now that you're looking at a four to five month hiatus as manager, it would be weird to come step back in. And I know Hudson was probably continuing most of the things that Greg was doing, but he's a substitute teacher. I don't think, 
Yeah, I just don't think it would make a lot of sense for Greg to come back at all. And I, but I felt that beforehand. So I am of the camp where we need to move on. Um, I think we can find coaches better than Greg. I don't think they'll be significantly better, but I think we can find coaches better than Greg. And at the same time, you've got to get all of these hires correct in this corporate infrastructure that has to be laid out because, you know, you're not going to get, you're not getting a head coach until you get a sporting right. director and you have the trickle down effects of all of these hires. Right. And I know that we're sitting there and we're kind of looking at the, we're looking at the bottom of the Jenga pyramid here and trying not to pull out the, the wrong peg, but all of these hires that have to be made now, you got to get them right. I mean, yeah, it's 23 and 26 is three years away, but there's an ish load of planning that has to be done on a lot of different levels. So you can represent this hemisphere as best as humanly possible with this growing squad that is, you know, that is becoming more experienced, that is becoming the, the next quote unquote golden generation, whatever, you know, all of the promise yeah. that's attached to this group, all of these hires have to be right well i don't think the sporting director hire matters for this golden generation and i think that's what the u.s soccer is finding um that it's hard to find the right fit for this federation sporting director gig because and this is going to be what they're going to run into and you've seen what the player with the uh, candidates who have turned them down right this is not really sporting in the way that we think of it. The sporting director of U.S. soccer is not just overseeing day-to-day -day operations of the teams playing on the field. And if anything, you have the GMs of both programs who do that, right? Mm -hmm. The sporting director is overseeing coaching development, which it seems to be a debacle right now, referee development, um, grassroots programs up and down the chain at 50 plus state associations. A lot of states have multiple associations looking at new, new you, New York. Um, so it's not, it's not the Carlos Bocanegra scouting, putting together a roster, uh, overseeing the Academy, right? That's not what's going on at the U S soccer level. And I think that's going to make it hard to find the sporting director especially when at this level, you do have to have some skin in the game. I do to be a sporting director because you're again, the, the job could be boring in the sense that your, your drive, your mission can't just be to win soccer games at this position. Yeah. Bar uh, burned and Coco are in this morning burned asking, <laughs> Do you think it would help the men's national team to find a midfield that can play with the ball better than Adams, Musa, and McKinney? Bart Byrne is not convinced that such a pressing heavy midfield, which is pretty bad on the ball except for Eunice's dribbling, can win games against top European and South American clubs. Oh, well, I mean, I agree. But who are those players? So that's the question right now that we need to try to find. Um, I think, Byrne, my general view of this year, uh, two years maybe leading up to the Gold Cup is – I think it's pretty clear who our starting 11 are. I don't think that's changed. Even Tim Ream, to be quite honest right now. Um, I don't think that's changed. And even if you want to say, okay, Tim Ream's out, then you just slot Chris Richards into that spot and you've got Richards and probably um, CCV. I don't know if Ream and Zimmerman are going forward, but let's just pretend. Your starting 11 is the standard that you have set. The goal for anyone not in that starting 11 is to prove that they deserve a spot there. So, again, we haven't seen a more ball-centric midfield, right? No, Jason. No, he's not. Um, it's not that they aren't good. It's are they good enough on the U.S. men's national team? And, again, this also has to do with who that next coach will be. Greg Berhalter liked the McKinney Musa Adams midfield. I would also posit that the McKinney Musa Adams midfielders are the three most individually talented players at those positions, even better than Gio Reyna in the midfield that we've seen. Right. So that's kind of be the problem 
is not the problem. The goal for this year is to try to find players who can raise that level, who can overcome those three. I don't know if they exist. Maybe Brandon Aronson, maybe Gio Reyna in the midfield. Um, but those three players in the midfield proved to be very good. Um, so, you know, do you give up a tactical shift to get lesser quality players in the midfield just because you feel like it might make you a little more stylistically fun? Also on the board discussing uh, sporting director. Coco, the sporting director job for the Fed is not an attractive enough job for the level candidate people. No, it's not. Want. People that it, are decided for the position have better club jobs. Because guys, guys, um, you know, people who are in football, right, they, one, the salary is not going to be there, to be, just be blunt, right? The salary at the U.S., for, for the people that people want, the salary of U.S. soccer sporting director is not going to be there. That's one. Two, as I laid out, the the job responsibilities are far more administrative than they are at the club level for that same title, right? Sporting director. It's not even quite the same as president of a club. Because I've, met, I've heard people throw out Garth Lagerway. Garth would be a great CEO, maybe, yeah. of U.S. soccer. I don't know if he would be a great sporting director of U.S. soccer because Garth now – as president of Atlanta United is overseeing a lot more operations um, than what he would have to do it as a sporting director of U S soccer. And again, he's overseeing, he's, he has more direct involvement with, with those. And I think that's what the, the drawback for most people is the direct involvement. Ernie Stewart described his time almost more like a politician trying to influence people down than he, he was actually making change. Um, and that's not a bad thing. I mean, that's his goal is right to kind of cast his vision across the entire organization of grassroots soccer in this country. But at the end of the day, his his actual impact is going to be very low because all these individual state associations technically get to do their own thing. Now that I don't know how much of Alston Bird that you have had the chance to read once again. Not all of it, <laughs> but it it is now out, and uh, I am still waiting for some kind of a response from Austin FC since we seem to have Austin FC on the brain this morning. Uh, where Claudia Reyna is concerned, uh, I thought it was interesting that the Vancouver Whitecaps came out with a statement specifically saying that at no time have they had any conversations with Greg Burhalter about Sebastian Burhalter and uh, you could feel that that there was a uh, the you could you could sense that the the light had kind yeah. of diminished at that point there was a decent amount of shade being thrown from what you have taken in from Alston Bird in the time that you've got left here this morning what were some of your larger takeaways so uh-huh. the first takeaway that i have is that i will again reiterate this really sucks for Rosalind Berhalter to have all of this put into public light Mm -hmm. for something that happened to her that was very traumatic. And to to be fair to Greg, a little bit traumatic for him, right? Like this was clearly an embarrassing situation that he, yes, put himself in, but something that he clearly regrets um, and something that he clearly has tried to move on from. And I think the entire Berhalter family and Rosalind's family have have tried to move on from. but that's my biggest takeaway is that sucks for them. Next one is that Claudio and Danielle, specifically Claudio with his connections, have abused their namesake and been really just bullies for a number of years. And, you know, some people are trying to give them grace by talking about the the unresolved trauma of losing a child, which I fully understand is real mm-hmm. that they probably still have some leftover unresolved trauma because I'm sure that doesn't just heal no. within a year of no. what happens, obviously. Right. Yeah. But I don't think that is a great excuse for the way that they've behaved for multiple years. This wasn't a trauma-induced incident at the World Cup. This is a 
pattern, not even a pattern. This is a modus operandum of behavior for Claudio Reyna when it comes to the U.S. men's national team uh, and when it comes to Gio. It, it, it is... He, he he really made himself look bad. Mm-hmm. They both he did. He made himself look bad. This was not no one else did this to him. Claudio did this to himself. And, and the other element that I wanted to discuss with you came from uh, PSRA and the comments that yep. Claudio Reyna uh, made that were divulged in Aust- in Alston Berg. Uh, Redacted also informed us that uh, pronoun Redacted received an email from Reyna in and around July 2018 in which Mr. Reyna complained about a female referee in a match involving Gio Reyna. We obtained an email from Mr. Reyna in July 2018 in which Mr. Reyna stated, quote, field referee everything. So embarrassing all the way around, end quote. Mr. Reyna sent a follow-up email that stated, and in all honest, seek Can we get real and have male refs for a game like this? It's embarrassing, guys. What are we trying to prove? A game like this deserves better attention. Uh, Redacted circulated the email internally and wrote, this is truly sad to see. I believe we should regroup internally and decide a path we want to take after this in his communication last week. This is not appropriate or acceptable. PSRA comes out and says, Mr. Rain is sexist and misogynistic comments about female referees are deplorable. PSRA considers his actions disqualifying for employment at MLS and beyond. MLS cannot provide a haven for Mr. Reyna's opinions while also celebrating the quality and diversity of its own officials, capital O. I mean, they're not wrong. No? Because when you see weekly, we have female officials in MLS. Mm -hmm. So, you know, first off, we need more female officials, period. We need more women to be referees at the soccer that we have at all levels. Um, This is just another example of what I see on a weekly basis where people think that just because you are a woman or a female, you're somehow not good enough to referee soccer. And that is bullshit. (laughs) There's the explicit rating for today. (laughs) There, I'll do this. No, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. That's the long, that's the long version. And and I, and I learned that that was the long version after the short, short, (laughs) for those of us that are on Twitter and on Twitter. Uh, It is, it is. And I'm sorry, that's a look, you can criticize a referee's performance without bringing in gender. Yeah. Like you just can't. You can Uh, universally suck. That's not an issue. You can be bad without being male or female. Yeah. And, and I agree. I think that I don't see how he can be involved in soccer in this. I'm sorry. Like this is, again, this is a pattern of behavior. Mm-hmm. This is, it's, again, it's not even a pattern. It seems to be just how he operates. Yeah. Period. Now, granted, it seems like this is how he operates when Gio is involved, but that's a problem. And then you wonder why the kid acted like a little spoiled brat at the World Cup. Yeah. Because that's the environment you, you were know? raised in. So. Right. Oh, I've heard that Gio will be back in the squad this March camp, so yeah. that's positive. Yeah. Um, I hope he doesn't play because Lord knows we don't need him to get hurt anymore. <laughs> I, I am of the opinion of let the Stars not play, especially yeah. that game down in Grenada. Bubble um, round into Grenada. Yeah. <laughs> Let's wait till they're home and on a real field down in Orlando. Um, but, yeah, I, I, it is positive that Gio supposedly will be back in the squad for this camp. Um, con- props to Anthony Hudson for, I don't know about mending the relationship, but just telling him that like, Hey man, we're good. Yeah. Um, which I think geo as a person probably, you know, felt some type of way about what happened at the world cup. Right. But also has like, as a professional probably understands like, okay, I got to move on. And I'm sure Dortmund has had, has been telling him similarly. Right. I mean, Dortmund is a very professional, well-run club for the most part. And his coaches there are very professional, very experienced, and I'm sure have no problem helping a very young, talented, very talented player grow. Um, so I'm glad he's back. I think if anything, you need to know that this report reflects nothing on Gio Reyna, his soccering ability, and his future career. Um, unfortunately, this will color a little bit mm-hmm. what his career looks like, um, and he has his parents to thank for that. 
Barnos Prime 19 at the Soccer for US POD. Get into the real world. We'll see you next week. Thank you all. See you all next week. Bart Keeler out. Dylan Butler in. Welcome to hour number two. It's Dylan Butler, ladies and gentlemen. Have you recovered from your high school experience? Uh, no. <laughs> right there with you, brother. No, and it's ongoing. Because um, I was going to ask about that. Yeah, no. It literally, uh, uh, I I went from the the day the day before my last basketball game. In addition to prepping for said basketball game, I was getting uh, I was getting charts ready and together for uh, for actually a, a college lacrosse game I'm doing. I'm pretty excited about it. Um, Marquette and Penn State. Um, Penn State ranked five in the country um, right now. Um, it's a game that's played here on Long Island at MacArthur High School. Last year, um, Penn played Duke in the game, so uh, it's kind of an annual thing where where um, you know, two teams from outside the area come uh, here to like the hot, you know, hotbed of lacrosse. So um, really excited to to um, get to be doing play by play for 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 the big one on Saturday. Yeah, because while uh, last week you were doing uh, which high school sport last week? Basketball. Basketball. Yeah. 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 I was right. I was right there with you on uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It was the high school basketball championships here in the state of Georgia. Replay is available on the GPB Sports YouTube channel. Where are they uh, playing this? Uh, right now, let's just say right now, it is in the middle of the state, and they try to do that to be equitable for all of the travel. schools, yeah. yeah, for travel and things like that. So, uh, the Macon Coliseum and the Macon Centerplex. It is a a uh, 50-year-old building that was recently renovated. Uh, it has minor league hockey from the SPHL for the Macon Mayhem. Ooh. Uh, but that is, I believe, a distant third to some of the previous incarnations of the sport that have played in that building. You have the Macon Tracks, T-R-A-X, and you have the Macon Whoopi. Yes, I remember that name. Yeah, see the Macon the Macon Whoopi was the the biggest one. Uh, so the the Macon Whoopi and literally uh, in some incarnations of their logo, a fig leaf what was uh, <laughs> was was integrated as a part of it for the Macon Whoopi. So yeah, my games uh, my games were at St. John's University, which which was nice, my alma mater. So. Good to uh, good to be back on campus. Um, um, yeah, no, it was good. It was uh, a great end to the to the basketball season, and now um, you know straight to lacrosse. In fact, last night, um, terrific lacrosse weather here on Long Island. Um, was uh, at Hofstra um, for for USA Lacrosse magazine doing a story on uh, Joey Spelina and Syracuse coming to um, coming to Hofstra to play a game. I have a, I have a cool one for you. Um, uh-huh. And the audience, because th- this goes beyond um, just wall pass, uh, wall pass, right? Yeah, wall pass Wednesday. Yeah. Um, so uh, the the Stewart Stadium is where they play lacrosse at Hofstra. <clears throat> the fourth floor is is uh, press box. Okay. You take the elevator down one floor. Um, it's the it's the you know um, highfalutin luxury suites. Yes. And then, you know, you get down to, to one and, and you're out and you go to the press conference. So uh, it's Syracuse and uh, Hofstra yesterday, right? So uh, elevator goes d- dings to three. And I said to the guy next to me, like, oh, wait, here we go, right? Like the, the you know, the, the well-to-do uh, sweet people. And it opens up and I have to go like this. <laughs> with, with Derek Coleman. <laughs> nice. <laughs> D.C. And wow. I'm like. Obviously Syracuse, I get it, but I'm like, you you've come to Hofstra on a random Tuesday when it's 25 degrees out to to watch a lacrosse game, and then it hit me afterwards. I wish it hit me in the in the elevator. I would have spoken to him about it, but um, he he went to he was at Syracuse the same time Gary Gate was at Syracuse, ah. and Gary Gate, you know, arguably the greatest lacrosse player of all time. Um, I my guess is they're boys. So he he came out to see Gary and 
um, and and of course Syracuse. So uh, pretty pretty wild um, running into to Derek Coleman in the, <laughs> in the in the elevator. No doubt, Jarrett Smith joining us for hour number two as well on a wall pass Wednesday. Amelia Who ran into Jared in the in the in the elevator yesterday. Anybody like Derek Coleman for you, Shaq? Anyone? <laughs> No, I mean, <laughs> well, the problem is most of the ones I run into, like I'm already 6'5", most of the ones I run into are equal height, except uh-huh. for the time, there there was the time where I did open the door to a tie place uh, and bumped into Dikembe Mutombo, which was startling. Is that, that a block or charge? Uh, I think it was a, I think it was a, uh, I, I don't know, it, it, it wasn't, it, it, w- it would have, it would have ended poorly for me. It probably <laughs> would have been a... Uh, Probably would have been a block on me because I don't think I could elicit a charge against the Kimmy Mutombo. Uh, 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 Jared, you try. No, 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 no. <laughs> Ungodly huge. Like I'm used to being one of the taller people in the room. Like yes. on media, on scrums, I generally like it, it, it scrums at Lanny Nights locker room. Like I generally stand behind everyone else because I just stick my arm up and over everybody, so I don't have these problems. And then you see someone who's over seven feet tall, and you, all you can do is go, oh, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, Rock. even Derek Coleman would have to look up to him because um, when I checked, I think he's he's 6'10". So. Yeah, yeah, those guys like that are just – that's just that's just different. Yes. <laughs> so, Emilio, with the wall passing in question, yeah. Emilio is pre-Red Storm. What is yeah, a Red yeah. Storm, actually? Yeah. Uh, uh, don't get me started. So, uh, <laughs> obviously, look, they, they were the Redmen. Um, it was never meant to be and in, in, in have an Indian connotation um, until, you know, like some support stat, support groups of of uh, of St. John started, uh, you know, using uh, uh, different things involving Indian. So, obviously, there was that there was that connection. And then as soon as there was an uproar, they changed it to, to, to red storm. Uh, it's a great question. In fact, I was at the press conference. Um, and by the way, it was never meant to be Redmond was like orange men. Like it was just the color that those guys wore. Yeah. Um, which is unfortunate. So anyway, I was, at, I remember being at the press conference, uh, for red storm and Lou Carnesecca was part of that press conference. He had since retired. Um, but you know, you just bring in, bring in Lou, right. Cause he's the, he's the, the godfather there. So, um, there, it was, it was the name red storm. And then there was a horse and people were like, uh, coach Karnaseko, why the horse? And then, you know, he just, he, he thought for a second, he's like, you know, oh, horses are, horses are, uh, virile and, uh, they're strong and they, and they can, um, you, you, you need, you need that in the big East. Like it was just, he was just, Oh, wow tap dancing up there but it was it was it was pretty funny so uh yeah i'm not a big fan of the red storm I never, when i was there i never chanted you know let's go red storm um in fact for for so for for even the school like they kind of got away with it where they where they rather chant johnny's you know like um yeah so yeah it's it's I never understood that decision from a marketing perspective. Um, and then they even got rid of the SJU. Like now it went to STJ and, and, and St. Joe's and Philly kind of, I guess, took full ownership of SJU. So I don't know. All right. Let, let's, let's, let's talk a little soccer here. If I was to mention CCL fever and, yeah. and, and, and Violet and Austin FC, we we got two tracks that we can we can talk about here. We can, and that's one of them is what Violet was able to accomplish, combined with what Austin was able to accomplish. What light? What lane of traffic do you want to talk about first? <laughs> as to who accomplished what they accomplished with this one? Uh, I it, I guess it depends on what mood you're in <laughs> do you want to dunk like speaking of Derek Coleman do you want to dunk on uh on, uh, on Austin I guess we could certainly do that um or you know do you romanticize like in a in a March Madness type of way the uh the Cinderella story that is Violette right so uh you can go either way um it's funny I saw I saw an Opta uh 
Opta's great with all their tweets, right? And I saw an Opta tweet that said they were the first Caribbean team to beat an MLS side since W Connection out of Trinidad beat the Red Bulls. Yeah. Uh, I was there for that. Actually, I went to Trinidad. I covered the first leg um, at uh, at uh, what was the stadium? Oh man, I can't I can't remember the name of it right now. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I was there. I was in Trinidad for that. And uh, what was it? 2009, I think it yeah, was. 2009. Um, and then the second leg at Giant Stadium, and you just assume, right? They would they would pull that out. They didn't, and uh, um, that was part of one of their worst seasons, if not the worst season they've ever had. Um, um, but yeah, no. So, uh, and this was even a bigger upset than that because they at least played regular um, league games <laughs> in Trinidad, right? So, um, yeah, it, it, it's. You know, you always love whether it's uh, whether it's Champions League, U.S. Open Cup, FA Cup in uh, in England, any any of these type of situations. You, you love the um, the underdog story. Um, so so that part is certainly fun. Um, and what a harsh harsh lesson for Austin uh, in their in their first uh, trip into CCL, right? Like where. Um, you know, you heard Josh Wolf talk about not having the right mentality in the first leg. Um, he did a poor job with as much rotation, which also showed you that he wasn't respecting his opponent. Um, so yeah, I think I think uh, I think a poor job certainly certainly by them, and and they and they paid a they paid a, a a big price by by the embarrassment of getting knocked out right away. Jared Smith for Dylan Butler. Yeah, and, and to that point for that game, uh, I feel like because this is something we saw Atlanta deal with. Um, man, like, God, okay, it would have been 2019. There's something about that and the 3 nothing loss on the road where it just – it always feels like it's a bridge too far. Austin – and I thought Austin was going to have to score earlier than they did to make it – to make it fun, and you know they made it fun. And the 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 shot chart on that game, it looks like a bunker that's been bombed for about three weeks straight. But it's it's something about you know, we we had this argument in 2019 with Frank DeBoer in his first season with Atlanta United that he went down two nothing on the road in Mexico, and instead of packing it in and saying, "Okay, we're down two nothing on the road, nothing good's going to come from this." Let's let's pack it in. Let's go home and see if we can knock this thing up at two. It goes down three, and it just – I don't know, man. It just feels like any time it goes to three, be it there, be it, you know, Red Bulls in Atlanta in 2018 in um, the MLS – in the uh, in the playoff Eastern Conference Final where, you know, I think if you had, if you, if you had to do it all over again, maybe, maybe you know, Armas packs it in a little bit more. It just feels like that three-nothing is – the straw that breaks the camel's back so often. And I mean, when you, when you look at this now, Dylan, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, I, I give Amro Tark a lot of credit. It was a banger in, in the first leg, but that's not the kind of banger that you want. <laughs> the, the hangover that you can have associated with something like this I mean, I know a lot of folks, Bart, Bart Keeler, who's on an hour number one, was looking at Jossie's artists and going, you know, okay, why? Uh, the hangover that you could have from this, it really could give you a pall for a lot of the season if you don't shake it off quick. For sure. And, and two, they didn't, um, let's, you know, their league uh, form hasn't really been great either, right? Yeah. Um, right out of the gate. So um, there is reason to, I think, be concerned early on um for for a team that uh i mean look right they were one of the best in, in the west a year ago um made the made the western conference final like they were um if not obviously for for lafc in their double um you know they were right there so for sure i think uh um you know they're still as you mentioned i mean jo I, I think josh i think zardis should have been or should be an upgrade at that position, but still not, you know, like if you go around, there's 29 teams, where does he rank among number nines? Right. Like, I don't think he's in the top 10 of, of number nines in the league. So, you know, granted you upgrade 
where you were poor last year, but not significantly, right? So, um, yes, that's a, a that's an, it's an issue. And also, you know, you put so many uh, eggs into into the Jerisi basket, right? Like that's not that's not going to work uh, often, right? Like he, he could have a great season, he could have a couple great seasons, but um, you know, he needs support, he needs help, and um, you know, they've they've not done a good job of that burned in the twitch pitch this morning tata said it best when talking about atlanta and ccl in 2019 clubs need to acquire institutional knowledge in quotation marks about how to operate in ccl when they first play in it applied to austin as well clearly institutional knowledge needed and this is this is going to be a lesson for austin and you hope if you're a fan of uh of verde that you're going to get a chance to to take that institutional knowledge and hop back in. But... And you would think you would think that he would have that, right? Like, cause he's, yeah. he's, he's played on the national team, right? Like he's gone to these places as a player and he knows what CONCACAF is about, right? Like to get CONCACAF, like he's been there. He, he's done that. He's not a, you know, this isn't a, I don't know, some European coach coming over to, to coach an expansion team and, and not having that understanding, right? Like he should, he should know, he should know better. Jarrett, what else is on your mind for Dylan this morning? Well, and in the other end of, of the CONCACAF Champions League teams that were in it last night, it felt like the last two games have been kind of like a slow start for a Philadelphia team that I think we all expected to be near the top of the East by the time it's all said and done anyway. Uh, counter to Austin, how much do you think last night can be a, a, a jumping off point for Philadelphia to find a consistent form uh, across the league as well as CONCACAF? Yeah, it's funny, right? Like you look back at the first legs and, uh, and obviously like there was major concern with Austin, right? Understandably. But um, I, I don't think anyone was like so much like, uh Oh, Philly, like, you know, yeah, they didn't get a goal, but you were never really thinking that they were, they had any sort of worry at all, right? Like they had That's rotated the biggest their thing. You don't want to lose yeah. the tie. But uh, but uh, but oh. I'll say this: so Orlando and uh, and Philly in similar boats, right? For that nil nil on the road. Yeah. But you felt so much better. And, and again, it's quality of opponent too. But you felt, I think, you felt so much better about Philly's chances um, coming uh, back home. I think than you do Orlando. Um, um, that said, you know, Gignac, uh, reportedly not part of, of that team. Right. So, um, that's a huge loss, but I'm jumping ahead to that, but to go back to Philly. Yeah. Like you just felt, yeah, listen, you know, we, we got a nil nil, we rotated our squad, um, and we're just going to kick it in the gear at home in which, you know, which is what they did. Um, and even that too, even though it didn't come right away, like still, you felt like, the floodgates are going to open and they're going to score the goals that they need. And, and they certainly did that. Um, and advanced, I, you know, I, I'm not certainly, um, breaking any, uh, ground here or news here, but yeah, I, it was Philly and LAFC for me. That were the two teams that you felt had the best chance this year of, of, of maybe repeating what Seattle did last year. Now the injury to Blake, how long is he out? That's a big concern. It wasn't in this round. Um, it could be certainly going forward. Yeah, and that was going to be my next point, is that you're having to do it uh, with uh, hashtag Bendik face in, in, <laughs> in, in, in net for Philly. But when you look at league play and that wall that's in front of, of Joe Bendik, the, the concern both in, uh, in uh, competition – here in this hemisphere and in Major League Soccer, you're not as concerned. And I think that uh, Jim Curtin said that it was not a long-term injury for uh, Andre Blake, uh, speaking in very, very Stanley Cup coach uh, overtones. Uh, <laughs> it's an upper body injury. Yeah, we get it. Uh, and and that's and we got into this discussion also, Jarrett and I, earlier this week, is that when you have coaches, whether you're talking about week-to-week competition or in hemispheric play, coaches don't have to tell you ish. They don't have to say word one about injuries. And I know that a lot of folks get wrapped up into this notion of, I need every piece of information given to me about my club so I can, you know, and about the other club. 
They don't have to tell you a bleeping thing about players, especially with a Philadelphia club that is trying to repeat in the Eastern Conference. Why give advance intel to your opponents about a length of time, about an injury for one of your most key players? Why even do stuff like that? But we found that it's not a long-term injury in quotation marks. And yes, I just did use air quotes from uh, Jim Curtin referring to Andre Blake and having Bendik face in net for the foreseeable future. You, you do wonder, though, if that if that's going to change um, the sharing information, I should say, is going to change in the near future with so much of um, of betting, you know, at the forefront, right? Like, um, I, I still think there's going to be a back and forth and there's going to be a, a push-pull with, with coaches not wanting to show their hands or, or – you know, like you see this a lot too. Like they release a, they release an injury report on like Wednesday. You know, yeah. and there's still there's still three days of training left before they play on Saturday. So I, I I could give two royal rats, knowing that information is going to be at a premium anyway. And if and if my club is sharing information, I don't care. I know the guy's injured. I know that there's depth available or that there's going to be an issue. Why should a coach? have to divulge information if they don't have to when it comes to competition. Yeah, no, I, I'm right there with I mean, you, you can want them to, but yeah, yeah. They're, they're only going to, they're <laughs> going to do what they're forced to do. So if they are forced to divulge information, yeah, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to do it within the boundaries of the rules because you know, we, we ran into this, I think, I it's think one of the body. one of the if you want an excuse from if you want an not excuse if you want an example from like Atlanta, well you ran into this a lot with Ezekiel Barco, where you didn't want to give information when he was dealing with a leg injury because you you wanted to be careful about how much he was going to be targeted, mm-hmm. and yeah because guys are going to target guys are going to target guys who are banged up especially guys who can be game changers so that's not that's not breaking news for anybody no. It's it's not when when you sit there and it's like okay I know that that guy's the number one gun I know the number one gun is dinged up to what extent is he dinged up it's an upper body injury or it's a lower body injury uh, if I'm a coach that's all if, within the parameters of the guide rules the guide posts when it comes to the rules I'm treating it like Stanley Cup postseason it's a lower body injury it's a game day decision that's how I'm doing it I have satisfied the parameters of what the league needs me to tell me. I mean, am I wrong, Dylan? I'm not. It's like I'm. I'm going with what the league wants me to say. It's a lower body injury, game time decision. We don't know yet. Listen, if the uh, speed limit is 55, right? Like you, you, you get in within, 50, you know, to 65, 64, you're good. Yeah, right. You're, you're right in there. You're right in that window. Hmm. Uh, I haven't had the chance to really catch up with you about uh, about Alston Bird. Uh, and now that we finally have the the revelations out of that investigation, the three months that they took to pour over every piece of information, when it comes to the Reinas, the Burhalters, U.S. soccer, when you've had to digest Alston Bird, and I know that it is a, it is basically the soccer investigative version of War and Peace. What are some of your takeaways from Alston Bird now that it's out? You know, it's funny. I, I, I mean, I've got, I, I haven't, <clears throat> I haven't read uh, it completely. Um, no. um, but look, it's, it's not all that different. It's a, it's a bad look. Uh, it's a bad look for the rain is um, uh, it's a bad look for us soccer. Um, it, it's just that there's nothing good that comes out of it really. Right. I mean, that's it's for, for me. Um, Nothing that's that um, emerged from that, I, you know. I'm not surprised, and 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 I don't think there are any any big re- uh, revelations other than just kind of details that we didn't have before, like specifics in in terms of um, you know text messages or things like that. So, uh, I, I I'm just looking forward to to the point where we could kind of move on from from that whole uh, uh, telenovela of of the Reinas versus the Burhalters versus U S soccer. And, um, yeah, I, I, I think, uh, and I think you spoke about it a little bit in the last hour, but I just, you know, I, 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 I feel bad for G R in this situation, right? Because, you know, if you put your self in his shoes, right? Like he's still young, right? He's still a kid. 
Um, he's he's he reacted as probably a lot of kids would. Um, he apologized for his actions, um, and then it was it was kind of move on from that. And then and then to have um, this whole thing happen with his parent, you know, like it's just embarrassing, right? So um, feel bad for the kid. Um, you hope within his club and and his and his friends. I know um, Joe Scali is really tight with him from their days with the NYCFC Academy. Like, you know, you hope there's a, a good support system for him and um, um, to to kind of work through through this whole situation. And and you know, I get I guess the best remedy probably for him is just to you know head down and and play your football right, like get to training and do your stuff and, and, and maybe it's best that he's not even in the States, right? Like that he's at least a little bit further away. I don't, I don't know how many, if any in the German media are asking him these questions. Right. So, um, um, but that, but yeah, my biggest takeaway from that is embarrassment uh, overall, but really feeling, um, for feeling bad for, for Gio who again acted as a kid. Um, and then the adults in the room just didn't do their part. Jared, go for it. No, and I, I um, don't go ahead and go to that because that's that's where I was yesterday when we were discussing this was if you know the issues with his parents and the way they've acted aside, if that's what he's you know been used to growing up. I mean, it's a matter of product of your environment. Um, and I'm glad you bring up the the issue at the World Cup and how he dealt with it because it sounds like, from my understanding, that he dealt with after the team spoke with him and after they explained everything to him, that he did everything he, he should have done. Got on the field in the last game. They had a come to Jesus meeting with him and things got better. And he took that positive step and hopefully he's able to do it. But it, I mean, on top of the usual pressure of being, um, you know, a, a worldwide soccer player who plays for a national team and is had high expectations to have even more drama and chaos thrown on it. I hope it, I hope it doesn't mess with him too much or at least that he's got people he can talk to and you know therapy whatever it may be that he needs to to make sure that it's that it's not inhibiting not just his playing career but his personal life all right we got uh last question on the board for you you want to talk about some actual games dylan this weekend (laughs) uh that we got you know when it comes to this grid coming up this weekend, you've got Red Bulls in Columbus at RBA, NYC in DC, Purple Team in Charlotte, Toronto, who has no Insigne, no Dio, no Akko, uh, Ionola. So they're in trouble at home against Inter Miami. Uh, Dallas and KC, you've got a Copa Tejas with Houston and Austin. St. Louis, we haven't had the chance to talk about St. Louis City SC. If they've got a home match against uh, San Jose, Colorado, Minnesota, LA, and Vancouver, what sticks out from this weekend? Yeah, start with the uh, start with St. Louis. Really, I mean, um, they're chasing history, right? Where they, um, you know, the only the only other team in um, MLS history to start an expansion season three um, zero was Seattle. No team has done that four zero. So that's what they're chasing at home um, against the San Jose team. That's been better. They've had a lot of late drama as has St. Louis. So, um, <laughs> that should, uh, should be fun. And, and listen, that's a great, that's a great story. Um, you know, we don't have the time to, to dive deep into it, but, um, you know, kudos to St. Louis city. I mean, you know, you talk about getting it right. Um, and there's so many reasons how they've gotten it right from, from bringing in their, their head coach a year in advance to uh, bringing in a lot of their players a year in advance, um, that's almost unheard of, right? Like y- you you already before the start, well before the start of preseason, you know, have guys together, um, getting acclimated to their new surroundings. So they could hit preseason kind of already a little bit comfortable in their environment, which um, so many, I, I don't know of any other expansion team that's had that, that ramp up um, or thought of that ramp up, I guess. Um, and, and they had, and they did so with a clear identity of how they want to play. And I think that's probably the most important part of it all, where you knew right away how they were going to play and they knew the players they needed for the way they wanted to play as well. Right. So, um, 
and they and they delivered. You know, like they they don't. Um, Look, they're going to hit their they're going to hit their 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 speed bump at some point, no doubt. Um, but they have not looked the part of an expansion team, and I think that's been uh, that's been a, a a revelation. It's been a, it's a it's it's been a fun. They've been the storybook, uh, uh, or they've been the feel good story of the of the start of the season. And then the other one is you know that early kickoff with um, Seattle LF, LAFC. That should be um, a lot of fun as well between. Uh, an LAFC team that like, you know, they see St. Louis's start like, well, hang on. You know, I know, you know we haven't <laughs> played, you, you might've played one more game than us, but you know, we're going to go and bang in three more goals and four more goals. And, um, uh, they've looked, you know, they've, they're in mid season form. Um, and you hear a similar thing too, from, from Trundolo too, right. Where like, they know they practice exactly. They know how they're supposed to play. We recruit for our, playing philosophy um so we could lose a chicho arango and not miss a beat um and that's been the case for them obviously what 10 10 goals and and three matches in all competitions so um they look great and and yeah like what version of seattle is going to come out this week right they were terrific the first couple weeks um we said that uh at least i've said i think their best their their best 11 is up there with anybody else's best 11 but they don't have the depth and Eber is out injured. Rui Diaz is not back in the field yet. And they suffered that loss to Cincinnati. So um, the the injury report that you referenced before, let's see. <laughs> let's see uh, what that looks like for Seattle um, and what and what team they put on the field um, against LAFC. And what's next to, to MLSsoccer.com and OSDB? Holy smoke. Uh, <laughs> I'm on the I'm on the CCL desk tonight. What do we have? Three, right? Tonight. Yeah, so three tonight. Um, long night, maybe extra coffee. Uh, for Real España at the Estadio Olimpico Metropolitano. Yeah. Purple teams hosting Tigres, and then your late matches, LAFC and Alo Alense, which is probably going to be over. And I mean, over early, not in the sense of over by uh 11 30 or 12. It will be over in this already. I think it's already over in the sense <laughs> of it's high. Alo uh, Alense, we don't know about. For OSDB, I'm going to speak with uh, one of the St. Louis guys, uh, the, the the winning goal scorer last week, Kyle Hibbert. Uh, Hibbert. So um, that should be fun. Uh, going to do a story on him. And and um, it's funny. He was one of those guys who was in too, right? MLS uh, next pro guy a year ago and thrust into the starting lineup, scores the winning goal, right? Like a, like a cool sort of um story uh as part of that and and uh as i mentioned marquette and penn state the cross on saturday on uh on varsity media's youtube channel so there you go and uh the seven-year college plan it's the the blutarski college plan for kyle hibbert seven years of college although it wasn't down the drain hey i uh, did five i did five but i switched majors um okay. through. I, i'm right there with you i did two years and nine months just to to get out and try to get out a year ahead of my class. Unfortunately, there were folks that uh, went into college the year before I did that took the full four years that I was fighting with that I didn't quite realize when it came to the job front. Enjoy your coffee. What's the mug this morning? Oh, yeah. And uh, uh, be a goldfish. Ted Lasso back out today, right? Yes, so. it is Ted Lasso season for those who celebrate. Uh, we'll talk St. Louis City SC in episode one of Ted Lasso next week. Be well, my friend. All right, boys. Dylan Butler. Hanging out with us as he always does on Wednesdays. And uh, Jarrett, to uh, kick off the final half hour of the show, uh, did you see Pep Guardiola in his in his press conference after? Well, and we haven't even had the chance to talk about Champions League yet, where Erling Holland proved, holy crap, five goals from Erling Holland as they destroyed RB Leipzig. Did you see the post match comments of Pep Guardiola? No, I did see the ESPN in their infinite attempt to basically downplay the entire damn sport and their coverage decided to be petty jerks about everything. That was fun. Um, the old, well, Messi's still the only one to do it without a penalty. Shut it's up. five goals in a Champions League game. I'm not even sure half of y'all at ESPN can spell the damn word soccer or football. Or Holland. So I don't really care what you have to say. Yeah, I don't. But – after the match, you show me you don't care. So why should I care about what yes. you have to say? Why should I watch your channel? Exactly. After the match, Pep Guardiola 
had a little fun as he was describing his heroes. And here's what Pep Guardiola had to say, courtesy of our friends at Manchester City, their own selves. I'm a failure in Champions League. <laughs> so don't worry. Listen, I'm going to, do, to, to explain a secret. So whatever happened this year in Champions League, winning, uh, even if I win this Champions League, we win this Champions League, we win this Champions League. In three Champions League in a row, I will be a failure. I'm going to tell you something. I have three idols in my life. Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods, and Julia Roberts. Okay? These are my three idols. So for obvious reasons, Michael Jordan and Tiger Woods is not good, and Julia Roberts as well. So Julia Roberts years ago came to Manchester. Not in 1990 with Sir Alex Ferguson win the titles, titles, and titles, and titles. Came in the period like we were better than United these four or five years. Huh? And he went to visit Man United. He, she didn't come to see us. So that's why this is, even if even I win the Champions League, will not be compared for the fact that Julia Roberts come to Manchester, they don't come to see us. So my idol. So that's why whatever happened, even I win the Champions League, will be compared for the disappointment I had. So that you have to know it. So Julia Roberts is one of Pep Guardiola's idols. I didn't know Pep had a connection to Smyrna that strong. And he knows that despite how well they do in Champions League, Julia Roberts will always end up going to Old Trafford. She's a fan of Manchester United. You don't have to live in hell like this. So he he was completely and totally just downtrodden discussing that one of his heroes, although I could probably guarantee you that the other two, the other two could probably go to the Etihad in short order and have no problem doing it. But that third one, Julia Roberts, seems to be the idol that is hanging over Pep Guardiola's head the most, knowing that how well he could do in Champions League, no matter how well he can do in Champions League, Julia Roberts will never be a fan of Manchester City. Why are you going to give me this ammunition that when Pep Guardiola inevitably comes to the United States, I would guess to coach uh, New York, New York City, City yeah. that of freaking course we're going to have Julia Roberts come hammer the spike. Oh, absolutely. See, why, now, you give a, why are you going to give a, a rival ammunition like that, Pep? See, that? that when, when he comes over and coaches in Major League Soccer, the best way to do it would be to have – and see, and we have to talk to our – we have to set this in motion right now. We have to set this in motion and keep this in mind right now. That when the moment is announced – that Pep Guardiola becomes the manager of NYCFC. You've got to call Julia Roberts' people immediately and plan for that first match with oh, NYCFC yes. Obviously. at Mercedes-Benz. Yeah, that's what we're saying. Julia Roberts has to be. It's, yeah, it's not complicated. That's what we're saying. It's not complicated. Like, no. she's going to hammer in the spike. She and you are going to antagonize and torment Pep Guardiola as much as humanly possible. Absolutely. This is not complicated. To see Julia Roberts in a five stripes jersey with Roberts on the back and whatever year she's coming by for her to put whatever number she wants. She could put she could she could like she could do do like I don't know, like whatever the hotel calculus on the back of it. I don't whatever the whatever the happen just so I can laugh at this pretty woman. Whatever I want to laugh at his misfortune. It's not personal, but I do want to laugh at his misfortune. Yes. Yes. See, and and burn. Burn knows. She's a red. Money can't buy you history, Pep. You might want to talk to his owners at QSI or at uh, the, the, the owners about that kind of stuff, the Abu Dhabi folks. I mean, if I want to be really petty, you can just sit there and talk about how the Reds have to get their history from Scotland, just like all of England did with the See? Scottish professors. See? Again, the, Eng- the, the Scottish professors come down and show the English how to play, and they forget everything about it. They had to go get the manager for the Reds from Aberdeen. So once again, you keep having to go north of the wall to get what you need, England. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And by the way, Sean and Sean and Byrne are are in midseason form. Sean's basically saying that Holland just scored again and just hit another one off the post. 
and uh and sean pep just scored two red red bull is trash so uh that was There's something beautiful about watching a red bull team in any country on this planet just get absolutely housed mm-hmm. that is true and a lot of it has to do with the fact that there is the rivalry so with Atlanta and Red Bulls. And it's, it's yeah. pettiness. And it's healthy. It's a healthy pettiness. Yes. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with uh, with healthy pettiness. And, and speaking of which, you know, like I said, we one of the main topics this morning has been Austin and Bialette. And to to get your pettiness so it's not so it's not internalized, so it is out there in the ether, so it is out there as a part of broadcast radio in whatever form it is consumed i I don't want this to linger in your person i want this to get off of your chest how much laughter amongst the stars to quote jimmy buffett universal laughter amongst the stars was there for you when violette survived And like i said i think we need to catch up with our friends from fc motown for some 1v1s considering that if it were not for fc motown the number of substitutions slash starters might have been impacted for Violette in their win uh, over Austin FC. I mean, the same thing I just we were talking about with Dylan. Like, <laughs> man, there's something about those three nothing deficits that are just absolutely crippling. Yeah. Like, it is a psychological thing, I swear, at this point, because you go down two nothing and you're thinking, Man, this is going to be an absolute pain in my ass to get back into this. You go down three nothing, and woe is me. Yeah, it was uh, hilarious. That's what it was. Uh, you want the answer? The answer was it was damn hilarious. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just because like you kept waiting for you kept waiting for them to to figure it out to like. Even in like five minutes left, you know, 10 minutes of stop time, like, man, Austin's going to get this goal, aren't they? Like, it might not be pretty, but they're going to find this goal. And they just never did. Mm -hmm. They just refused to. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. So you're, you're dealing with that and you're, you're looking at, uh, it's just woof. And you, you just absolutely wonder how much of this is going to literally linger it, the whole it, damn thing hinges on the fact that the whole damn thing hinges on the fact that uh, the club from Haiti didn't commit one of the most hilariously bad own goals that we've ever seen. That's the difference in the game. Mm-hmm. That that right there is the difference in the game. Somebody didn't commit a hilarious own goal uh, over 180 minutes, and that proves to be the difference. You're welcome, everybody. Have a good flight. I hope y'all have a nice trip back to Haiti. Yes. Well, yeah. Or just, back to DR, wherever you're going. Just be safe if you're going to do that. That's it. What are you doing? News from Atlanta United that has come out in the last couple of minutes here uh, involving uh, Yorgis Yakamakis. He has been called up by the national football team of Greece for two matches in March. So Yakamakis gets his, gets his call up with, uh, with the Greek national team. So uh, once again, you're getting a lot of call-ups from uh, a lot of national teams for, for folks from Atlanta United, obviously Jarrett, it's that double edge thing. It's cool, but you know, there's like league going on here and stuff. So uh you know, Gonzalo Pineda is going to have to sit there and try to figure out, okay, how things going to look. Miguel what, Berry. Yeah, it's going to look like Miguel Berry up top. That's a guarantee. That's what the first thing is. But maybe it, Machope Chole. Like maybe. Yeah, yeah. And then what it does is it gives Jackson Conway another test as well. Another opportunity. Depends on how. Uh, honestly, might depend on how healthy Machope is because he was getting a lot of those minutes in preseason and. Thought he was really good in those moments. Um, not perfect by any stretch, but it seems like that's kind of up for anybody who wants to grab it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's the uh, that that's the the latest news out of Atlanta United. Very very cool stuff there. And you know, once again, when you have it's it's the great thing about it. It's like all right, you have all these national teams tapping your team on the shoulder, 
That means that you're a desired commodity from every everyone that has been assembled by the front office or Atlanta United. But at the same time, it presents those challenges late March of trying to figure out, OK, how are we going to make things work? How are we going to piece things together? So we will uh, we will definitely see how things are pieced together for uh, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're ultimately you're going to be in better shape than like I think uh, Minnesota. Oof. I think it's Minnesota. It's going to be missing six players oh. uh, during during the international window. Wow! Uh, so you're in better shape than them. Congratulations! <laughs> yes, you are in better shape than them. Uh, so you've got that to uh, you got that to hang your hat on. So uh, good stuff there. I just you know. Uh, you know, Erling Holland scoring five, seven nil win over Leipzig, aggregate eight one. And you've got uh, a couple of, of Premier League matches today that are your makeup games, which means that Prem and Proper comes out tomorrow. It's Brighton, Crystal Palace, Southampton, and Brentford. You've got Napoli and Eintracht Frankfurt. Napoli's up two nil in the Champions League. Real Madrid's up five two with Liverpool. That first leg, I know that that shocked a lot of folks with a 5-2 result at Anfield. And so now uh, Jurgen Klopp says, uh, you know, we have a 1% chance at Bernabeu. We give it a try. You're up. You're down three heading to Real Madrid. And it would take something just as catastrophic that happened to you at Anfield. Uh, Jordan Henderson, by the way, not in the squad for the uh, the match is at four o'clock this afternoon. So you've got uh, uh, Bicetich looking uh, not to be a part of the roster for a little bit. Jordan Henderson not in the squad. The, you want to talk tall orders? You got a tall order here when it comes to uh, Liverpool if they're going to try to make up this three goal deficit. Kareem Benzema is fit after making after missing the weekend over Espanyol. Vinicius Junior is. Uh, likely to be the major threat for the, the counterattacking. He's going up against Trent Alexander-Arnold, and you're, you're looking at uh, Kroos, Modric, Kareem, Casemiro, Vinicius Jr. going up against that bunch. Uh, Bicetich, stress problem with an adductor muscle. And he was playing with the U21s a year ago, having earned a regular place in the squad. Traveled to Madrid, but will, take, will, will not take part, according to Jurgen Klopp, a stress response in his adductor which is absolutely bad. He doesn't feel a lot, but he is now out for, I don't know exactly how long we have to let it settle and we will see when he can come back. So once again, no Bicetich, no Jordan Henderson when it comes to uh, Liverpool down 5-2 heading to the uh, the Bernabeu. Yeah, and uh, I mean, Emilio, just uh, Emilio in the Twitch pitch, he goes, yeah, I just noticed that uh, Miguel Barry just goes by Miguel on the back of his jersey. I mean, we see that a lot, Jared. Sometimes you won't see traditional last names. You'll see you'll see first names uh, when it comes to to certain players and how they want to be identified. So, not necessarily something completely out of the norms. Just seeing Miguel on the back of the Miguel Berry jersey. Yeah, it happens. Um, guys just have different ideas about what they want to put on their shirt. Um, it's, it's it's individual expression. Yeah. Some people are more traditional about it than others. Eh. Yeah. Uh, the delegation representing Sheikh Jassim's bid for Manchester United will be at Old Trafford for meetings tomorrow. Some of the Sheikh's closest personal advisors will be there while they are also expected to visit the training ground. Jassim remains 100% committed to buying 100% of the club. Meanwhile, the delegation representing Sir Jim Ratcliffe's Ineos bid will visit on Friday. So... Uh, that's what you're staring at for the the bid, and if and for with Sheikh, Sheikh Jassim, he's like it's 100 percent, or I'm not interested. There's going to be no section, no per, no purchase piece. It's got to be 100 percent for Sheikh Jassim. Uh, Zlatan has been called up to the Sweden squad at the age of 41, and he's only been uh, with AC Milan three times because he's been injured a lot this year. Only been capped five times by his country since 2016. Last Sweden goal came in 2015. But he has been called up for his nation's European Championship qualifiers against Belgium and Azerbaijan later this month. And so Zlatan Jarrett now gets to conquer the European Championships. Okay. Is, is he going to actually conquer anything? 
Or is he just going to walk around and pretend like he conquered something like he's part of the U.S. military in the 70s? Oh, I'm well. So w- w- which way are we going to go here, Zlatan? Oh, I'm, I'm fairly certain he believes that he's uh, going to be conquering everything. Absolutely everything. So Believe whatever you want. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. And so that's that's the beauty of Zlatan. Zlatan believes that Zlatan has conquered everything. And that's what uh, that's what he's going to do. Uh, David Moyes found this interesting. Uh, right now, in, in the in the Premier League, uh, David Moyes and West Ham, they're they're having issues. They they are a part of that gaggle in Group Number Three that we talk about a lot. That is uh, sadly chasing after relegation, which is not really something that you want to chase after. But when you have nine teams separated by five points and West Ham is only out of the relegation zone on goal difference, you are 16 goals ahead of Bournemouth, who got slapped earlier this season and uh, forced a managerial change. So, yeah, you are one of three teams at 24 points. You have Leeds behind you at 23. You have Southampton behind you at 22. And you're just out of the relegation zone on goal difference. When asked about what's going on for his, his activity in the Europa League, David Moyes said, reaching the quarterfinals would be great. It's the first thing you have to do. The big thing we really want is to get to the final, but we can't do that unless we get to the quarterfinals first, and that's what we want to do. Odds on West Ham getting... <laughs> Why does he talk like a Leslie Nielsen character? Genuinely curious. Because at this point in his uh, career, it, it is looking like you're really chasing after that kind of stuff. And the thing is, you're in the Europa Conference League right now. You're not even in Europa League. Hey, it's a fun competition. You're in Europa Conference League. It's a fun competition. And you are in the, the last 16 in the Europa Conference League, and you want to make the finals. You are a big favorite, understandably so, tomorrow, going up against AEK Larnica out of Cyprus. You're a minus 417. Understand that you'll probably get to the round of eight. But in the round of eight, you have the possibility of these folks being with you. Fiorentina, Basel, Lazio, AZ Alkmaar, Nice, our buddies from uh, uh, Sheriff Tiraspol, and Villarreal. Even if you make it past AEK Larnica, which you should, you've got a lot of folks that will be chasing after Europa Conference League glory that are better than you. You might make it to the round of eight, but that's about it. You might just survive in the Premier League, but considering how many folks are just surrounding you right now, I'm not so sure. So good on you, David Moyes, for one of the sound bites of the morning. Yikes. Uh, Arsenal have announced Stan and Josh Kroenke have become co-chairs of the club. Tim Lewis has been appointed executive vice chair. It just sounds like that they just felt like printing up new business cards at Arsenal and rearranged a couple of the offices and who gets the, the corner office and who gets the glass windows. Arsenal, quote, the appointments are a recognition of how our leadership structure has evolved over the past several seasons since Cronky Sports and Entertainment assumed 100% ownership of Arsenal Football Club in 2018. Stan, Josh, and Tim have worked together to drive our club forward, and their appointments bring clarity to our structure that reflects their roles and responsibilities and will ensure we continue in our pursuit of progress and success, end quote. So good on you. You, re- you rearrange the offices. UEFA says it's looking into events at Porto's Estadio do, uh, do Dragao on Tuesday night that left hundreds of ticketed Inter Milan fans stuck outside the stadium for their Champions League last 16 leg. Inter Milan chief exec Beppe Morota said a formal complaint would be made to the governing body following a goalless draw, which still the 1-0 win on aggregate for Inter, 
but hundreds of supporters missed kickoff after being denied entry by the authorities, with safety fears being raised as large queues formed. Morota told Sky Italia, quote, I want to spare a thought for circa 1,000 fans who were left outside the stadium even after regularly purchasing a ticket. I saw footage of families who were locked outside, children crying who had flown here from Italy. We had met with the local authorities this morning, and they assured us that the fans would be allowed in, even beyond those limits of the away section. Instead, this did not happen. These were, for the most part, families with children who certainly weren't here to perpetrate acts of violence, but to support their team. I don't believe the situation was so serious as to ban their entry. UEFA said the regulations stipulate 5% of the stadium capacity has to be provided to the visiting team in a segregated area for supporters, uh, responsibility for the safe and secure management of spectators, and the associated ticketing policy are determined by the match organizer and the relevant authorities. Mitigation measures were discussed between both clubs. UEFA is currently looking into the matter. Uh, Morocco has joined Spain and Portugal, by the way, in the World Cup 2030 bid. So we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, Ukraine may also be able to host some games in 2030. They're looking at, as a part of it, uh, going up against the Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, Chile bid. And also you could get the bid from Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Greece for 2030. So uh, Liverpool has increased their season ticket prices. Uh, Local general sale, nine pounds per ticket, said no more than 17 pounds will be added to the price of tickets in general. Uh, Liverpool supporters are pretty hot about that. Uh, let's see. Gossip rumor and innuendo. Get into gossip rumor and innuendo. Before we go, we'll get into what's on TV and what you can watch. Obviously, the Champions League stuff, that's on at 4 o'clock this afternoon. You can probably watch all of it on either Paramount Plus or 2 to NA. Copa Libertadores is on BN and BN and Espanol at 8.30. Atletico Mineiro and Millonarios. Your triple header for Champions League is on FS2. Real España, Vancouver, Purple Team, Tigres, LAFC, and Alualense. No Gignac for Tigres heading to Orlando. Uh, Premier League is at 3.30, Southampton and Brentford. Uh, BN and Espanol, Copa Libertadores, Medellin and Magallanes is at 8. If you want to catch some of this stuff and you don't have the networks to do it, you can sign up for Fanatis fntz.co slash soccer down here. Champions League, Real Madrid and Liverpool's on 2 to NA along with the triple header in Champions League. So a very busy day on 2 to NA. 4 o'clock till about 12.30. You can watch soccer. On the plus, Sunderland, Sheffield United, the championship, USL championship. El Paso and Colorado Springs at 9 o'clock. Before we go, we need to talk about quickly the fact that there actually is a schedule for Atlanta United 2 and MLS Next Pro. Paramount Plus, Real Madrid, Liverpool, Napoli, Frankfurt at 4. 1 o'clock, you've got Europa Conference League with Istanbul, Basakshi here, and Ghent. Brighton, Crystal Palace is on Peacock. Vix and Vix Plus have Napoli and Frankfurt. Uh, gossip rumor and innuendo before we go. It is, once it loads, once it decides to load, it would be nice if you would load, perhaps. Maybe if we hit the gossip button. Here we go. All right. Spurs not willing to sell Harry Kane. Contract runs out in summer 2024, even if he uh, doesn't sign a new deal. Luis Enrique would be interested in taking over at Spurs if uh, they part company with Antonio Conte. Mo Salah strongly considering leaving Anfield despite signing a new contract. Liverpool stand to make a big profit on him. PSG is chasing. Alexis, attracting interest from a number of clubs, including Liverpool and Newcastle, ready to leave Brighton in the summer. Uh, Beppe Morota, speaking of Inter, says Romelu Lukaku will return to Chelsea when his season-long loan spell comes to an end. Edward Mendy has held contract talks with Chelsea, but the two parties aren't close. Barcelona looking to raise £70 million with the sale of Frankie de Jong. Number one transfer target this summer for Chelsea. They'll have to battle it out with Manchester United. Speaking of United, they're going to offer Uruguay and Facundo Palistri a new contract before loaning him out next year. That's from Fabrizio Romano. Leeds have agreed to sign Barcelona forward Ilias Akomash, who is 18 at the end of the year. I think they're going to sign him at the end of the year. He's not 18 at the end of the year. Mundo Deportivo there. Wolves' Ruben Neves, no longer a target for Barcelona. Argentina, Manchester City. Julian Alvarez agreed to a new five-and-a-half-year deal with the Premier League club. That's to make sure that they keep him. And in case somebody's interested, they're really going to have to pay. Newcastle interested in Arsenal's Kieran Tierney. Gunners would be looking for between 35 and 40 million pounds. Liverpool, yes. You're just going to keep him, like, get a, yeah. get a, have him just to 
just, yeah. to, just to make sure that he's with you when he's hurt. Yes, basically. Because that's uh, pretty much what you're doing. Yes. You, and I like Kieran Tierney a lot. He just stays hurt. Yes, that is true. Uh, Liverpool, Newcastle racing to sign Argentine midfielder Alan Varela from Boca Juniors. PSG considering offering Sergio Ramos a new deal at the age of 37. His current two-year deal ends in the summer, linked with a move to MLS or Saudi Arabia. Ashley Lawrence has not has decided not to renew her contract with PSG Feminil. She's going to leave the club at the end of the year. Uh, Leeds duo Nonto and Weston McKinney could be involved in a swap with Juve in the summer. Currently on loan, Juve are open to making it a permanent deal with Nonto going the other way. And Lee Carsley could leave his post at England U21 after this summer's European Championships. Stevie G, Frank Lampard, Scott Parker could be considered to replace him at the U, at the U21 level. So there's that. Uh, Jarrett, we actually have a schedule for Atlanta United 2. Finally. Finally. Yeah. And uh, the interesting dates that were that were placed out there, at least by Will, and I think that it is be, it is being uh, recommended that a field trip to Huntsville be in order. For- See, I'll do that anyway because I like going to anything that has like you know space associated with it. Yes, like, not spaces and like you know room, but like mm-hmm. outer space, like yeah. outside of the planet getting into the interstellars of the uh, of the universe yeah i'll go there happily i might miss the game mm-hmm. J- jack collison makes his return to the fraction sunday july 23rd with hunt city the return fixture for atlanta united 2 is sunday september the 10th at joe davis at seven o'clock so those are your those are your times and that will be uh, – the schedule starts off with a, a, a front-loaded home schedule, no surprise, considering the uh, the field that they play on. is kind of busy on Saturdays in the fall. Starts Sunday, March 26th with New 2 coming to town. Then a week later, Red Bulls 2 on April 2nd. They go to New York on Sunday, April 9th, come back for OCB on the 16th. So five of your first six – and six of your first eight are at home. So you've got a chance to make your hay early on uh, before mid-May. And you're, it is March 6, April 2, on the road, April 9, April 16. You're back at home, April 22, April 30. You're away at Inter-Miami 2, May the 7th. Crown Legacy visits on May the 14th. And there were some interesting things that I noticed in the scheduling, pairing it up with Atlanta United matches, is that there are some instances on the road where Atlanta United 2 will play the day after the parent club plays in a in a road game. And I thought that that was very, very interesting scheduling by uh, MLS Next Pro, where, let me see if I can find the, yeah, so uh, the, and then we're actually paired with the parent club. So like in April, the, the match with uh, Red Bulls, you get the match with Red Bulls 2 the next day at the Fraction, April 2nd. You go the next week, you're at NYC. Then the next day, the second team plays NYCFC 2 in MLS Next Pro. And so there are instances like uh, Chicago Fire 2 on April 22nd. Then Atlanta plays Chicago on the 23rd. So there are some interesting scheduling uh, elements that were applied to MLS Next Pro for the sake of budgeting and traveling. And I thought that that was a very interesting thing that the schedule makers took into account with the MLS MLS Next Pro squad and their parent club. I mean, it makes sense. And we actually saw, um, we actually saw something that can factor into it the other day. And I don't know that it would uh, because that's a lot of, that's a lot of running and cooling off. And, uh, but, but we saw Saturday that a Johnny fortune, played with Atlanta United, he was on the sheet for Atlanta United, unless there's another fortune in the academy that I don't know of. <laughs> yes. And, man, look, so many of these kids have siblings. Like, look, we, I needed a spreadsheet for the number of Carltons there were. Yes. If there's another fortune, that's fine. But otherwise, AJ was on that sheet for the twos. So you might see that with guys who I, I wonder what the restriction will be, honestly, of, hey, if that guy made the bench with the first team and he didn't 
do anything other than some light jogging in the second half on the sideline, I would assume he's eligible to play for the twos. Yeah. And playing them after the twos a lot of times will create that situation where you're able to where you're able to have um where you're able to, to to have guys get a run out. Yeah. If they're playing the day after of, hey, so and so didn't play, you know, Jackson Conway, you know, Mitchell Chol, um, Luke Brennan. Well, Luke Brennan, not really, unless you're having an emergency call up because he's not a uh, homegrown until next year. Right. Um, but any of those guys who are homegrowns, yeah, they, uh, Ronald Hernandez, who wore the armband for the twos in their preseason game last weekend. Yeah. Like any of these guys who aren't getting time, they can go get time there at least and, and get some game action and get some live fire. Yep. Uh, Tafka, who's in this morning, says it should be practically every matchup. The twos travel with the first team of a chartered jet shoes. Big savings. Yeah, and I think that's what's in oh, play here. I absolutely agree. Um, you're saving money. You're uh, in that instance, yeah, you're saving money. Um, you're potentially saving travel costs. Yeah. Um, and, look, I mean, you're you're also keeping guys fresher. All yeah. I can ever think about with, with the charter stuff is talking to somebody who once played in the Arena League. Back when arena football, like early 2000s, when it was at its heyday, if we want to call it that. Um, for me, it was a heyday. I loved the Arena League. So yes. Much. Well, back when the Georgia Force um, was like uh, noted Chicago Bears head coach uh, Matt Nagy was the quarterback for the Force and was like an MVP candidate. Like, I don't know. I don't know how many of y'all remember this. So, like that Force offense. That the one year they went to. Arena Bowl, and they lost on a last-second field goal to Colorado. And I had to watch uh, John Elway's horse face up on the TV. Colorado Crush. They lost on like a last-second, like not a not a short field goal either. It was like a thirty-five-yard field goal, which those arena uprights were so narrow. Yes. The dude, like went like Justin Tucker esque, split it down the middle. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like that Matt Nagy was quarter, was one of the quarterbacks on that team. Uh, Troy Bergeron was one of the wide receivers. Um, yeah, Troy Bergeron was a discovered talent in the arena. Like, oh my! He got a tryout wow. with the Falcons at one point because Arthur that. Blank bought the Georgia Force and like had the idea of what if we just move some of these guys around? And you had like Troy Bergeron ended up like getting into like training camp with the Falcons. I think he made the practice squad, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. Yeah. Oh man, let's go. Kind of, hold on. Uh, oh, no, he's going Troy Bergeron looking. Yeah, Troy Bergeron. Yeah, he played uh, played with the Bill. He played with the Georgia Force, and he played with the Falcons, with the Bills. He was on practice uh, practice squad with the Dallas Cowboys as well. Yeah. Oh man. Uh, yeah, like um, the Derek Lee, not not the baseball Derek Lee. There was another Derek Lee who played. Um, Played for the Georgia Force, and this, this is like 2004, 2005. Um, man, like, yeah, that that team, like uh, Chris Jackson, Derek Lee, and Troy Bergeron, like the Georgia Force had three Ooh. ungodly wide receivers. Oh man, that was a beautiful time because they like, they went when they went to the playoffs, they just trucked people until yeah. the Arena Bowl when they made mistakes and they ended up um, ended up losing in the final. Uh, I, I digress. Uh, I'm uh, talking to someone who played in arena ball that like San Jose was the place to be when you played uh-huh. because San Jose chartered their flights and it mm-hmm. makes a difference. Yes. It absolutely. absolutely makes a difference for guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, also in our, in our DMS, Tofka has uh, attacked the schedule issues that include the, uh, that leagues cup has prevented and he do, he's done two separate options 30 and 32 teams and with the the Tafka variant he says it makes the first half of the season crucial and multi-tiered battles across the board to secure tiered spots rewarding teams for good performance gives the league essentially two months to plan and schedule the second half of the year just as vital chasing after CCL avoiding early elimination playoff seating etc guarantees matchups highly competitive as teams are tiered together by quality so, and he did it for a 30 and a 32 team variant. And it goes from like late February to early December. So very little time off uh, in, in Tafka's scheduling. So Tafka's already attacking the schedule and how it could work with the new Leagues Cup competition. So very, 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 very cool stuff from our resident uh, uh, scheduling mathematician, 
who's got a PhD in scheduling, man. Uh, so I, I found the numbers on this because I went down the rabbit hole. Of course uh, you did. In 2005, Jordan Bergeron had 31 touchdown catches and Derek Lee had 33. Yes. <laughs> Jesus. And how many, and, and who, and when Nagy was quarterback for that squad? Oh, man. Um, I was trying to figure out who the starting quarterback was to figure out how what the what the passing stats were when two of your receivers caught. It was Matt Nagy was the quarterback, yeah. So so how many touchdowns did he throw outside of the sixty four to Bergeron and to Derek Lee? I'm trying to find that. That was two thousand five. Yeah, Matt Nagy, two thousand five Arena Football. Oh man, Um, it was second team All Arena. Second team. Yeah, first team was Matt Gre- uh, Mark Grebe, who played for San Jose. San Jose, yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah, that's uh, definitely when you when you look at yeah Grebe and San Jose with the SaberCats, that was just some absolute unconscious passing by him. Uh, let's see, he threw three hundred and seventy three touchdowns in the Arena League. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, uh, 2005. Here we go. Uh, threw for 3,000 yards and 66 touchdowns. <laughs> so it was either to Lee or to Bergeron that year. That was yeah, oh, it, it gets better. Uh huh. In 2006, uh, Matt Nagy threw for 85 touchdowns and 11 interceptions. <laughs> 11 interceptions. What the hell is Matt Nagy thinking, man? I don't know. They're probably the same thing he was thinking when he was like coaching the. Um, coach the Chicago Bears. Dude. Man, that, yeah, that, um, yeah, that 2005 uh, Georgia Force team was, yeah, whew, uh-huh. they were good. Insane. Yeah, they were. Crazy. And so, of course, uh, my, my protector of the interwebs is saying that it's a bad gateway as I try to search Matt Nagy statistics. So uh, on that note, we've got matches today. You've got the stuff to to keep an eye on. It is 4 o'clock Champions League, triple header CONCACAF Champions League 6, 8, and 10, or uh, 6, 8, 15, and 10, 30. So you could start watching at 4. Really, you could start watching uh, the Conference League in Europa, and you could see, uh, you could try and see uh, who's going to advance in the Europa Conference League out of the round of 16. Uh, start that early and just keep watching soccer all the way through till about 12, 20, 12, 25 tonight with LAFC and Aloha Lindsay, our friends from Costa Rica. So uh, very, very busy day. Once again, if you want to watch other competitions, go to Fanatis and subscribe there. FNTZ.co slash soccer down here. It's good for the show. Good for the network. Uh, once again, thanks to our friends at uh, Trinity Christian for being a part of uh, the high school games that we broadcast. And thanks to our friends at Perry for adding the uh, the scarf that we will be putting here in Office HD in very short order and trying to find uh, shower rods that actually can hold these things so my entire situation does not collapse upon itself like we have had in closets here in the house that uh, when they installed the uh, shelving, they didn't install it on the studs. They just kind of randomly installed it at like five and a half, six feet up, and then things collapse after 20 years. So there you go. Uh, that's your run. So, uh, Jarrett, since it is uh, another day, we'll be back at it again tomorrow at 10.05 and Thursday, or 9.05. And then at 10.30, we're going to be spending time with our friends at Tormenta as they are working their way to carry North Carolina. So normal show at 9.05 till 11, whenever. But at 10.30 specifically, we're catching up with South Georgia Tormenta as they drive to carry North Carolina. So, It'll be good to catch up with the USL League One champs. Uh, Jared, since it is that particular time of the day, send us home. Most of y'all. And since it's the end of the show for Jason, for Jared, for Nick, I'm just John. Played safe, everybody. It's the end of the show. That means I get to do this. We'll see you at 9 to 5 tomorrow morning.